In Todd Miller's new book, Storming the Wall, he tells us that when the Berlin Wall fell in 1988, there were 16 border fences around the world. Now, he says, there are 70. What we're looking at is what one geographer called, quote, a situation of border, border fortification in a warming world. In India, one such militarized border wall is meant to keep out the millions of Bangladeshis whose farmland is increasingly under the ocean. In the US, the administration hopes to keep out farmers from Honduras, where the climate extremes are disrupting farming, are the greatest in the hemisphere. Wars for oil and gas in the Middle East have displaced incredible numbers. In Syria, over five million people are now living outside the country in camps. The newly expanded border regimes around the globe are meant to enforce a division in the face of extreme climate change between, as the title of another book terms it, the secure and the dispossessed. While we in the climate movement in the US and Europe are organizing to stop the flow of fossil fuels and demanding an emergency transition to renewables, military think tanks here and around the globe are churning out white papers on the kind of security regimes that will be necessary to defend the major industrialized nations from the hundreds of millions they expect to be on the road by 2050. <clears throat> like economic refugees in general, those forced to roam have no legal status. A resident of the South Pacific whose island has been inundated has no national rights anywhere on this globe. Climate change is underway, and its reality can be increasingly measured, not only in parts per million, but in human lives. A third of the world's population lives on the coast, and much of the remainder will face weather extremes. In one of the most dystopian responses to climate change, major foundations and USAID are pushing reactionary population control measures. In Africa, Latin America, and India, <coughs> These plans are carried out, all to nip those unruly populations in the bud, all in the name of defending the globe from climate change disruption. On the level of brute force used by extractivists and their governments, we can cite The Guardian, who tells us that today there are four environmental activists assassinated each week. Today in the US, we have survivors of Katrina and Sandy, let alone Harvey and Maria and the fires out west who remain abandoned by the system. Today in Connecticut, we must rally against the cruel decision of FEMA to kick Puerto Rican climate refugees out of their hotels in Hartford and other cities in the state. In the US, fear of the dispossessed and the future dispossessed is used to justify ever more powerful surveillance and police powers. All, and all this, of course, comes on top of a legacy of environmental racism whose virulence and scope continues to astound. People still don't have air to breathe, they don't have water to drink in Flint. Um, these stories get buried, but they do, the horror does not end. Trade unionists for energy democracy remind us that 20% of the world's population, or 1.6 billion people, have no regular access to electricity. The point that I'm making is that the climate movement is faced with a momentous choice. Without the concerted intervention of people with a sense of justice and humanity, the response of the powers that be to climate change is clearly a very dark and a very reactionary one. It's a vision of walls, wars, policing, displacement, dispossession, gentrification, populationism, and an ever-increasing effort to separate the secure and the dispossessed. Such a future is unacceptable. Shaping an alternative future is up to us. To challenge this dystopia, we cannot limit ourselves to demanding lower parts per million. <clears throat> what do we need to do? We must somehow create a social power that's greater than theirs, a view of the future more powerful than theirs. We must find a way to create a majority movement against the fossil fuel enablers, but also against the dystopian world they envision in the wake of climate change. A majority movement would have to admit the role of the Pentagon in stoking fossil fuel wars and spreading environmental destruction. 
A majority movement must be fortified by the powerful moral legacy and combativity of the civil rights and African American movements for self-determination, of the vigor of the youth from Black Lives Matter. It must have the power of organized labor, who, however threatened and diminished, starts and stops the trucks, the trains, construction and production every morning of every day. It must have the imagination and the grit of the immigrant rights movement, who just 12 years ago, in 2006, put millions of people into the streets and shuttered the doors of businesses around the country in the largest US demonstration to date. And can a movement flourish today that does not appear as an ally to women and gender nonconforming people? It's hard for me to imagine that's possible. So our teaching today is meant to challenge us to think about how we create a climate movement that is seen by all as a movement about justice and about emancipation. Our speakers have all thought about this and thought about it deeply. And each of the workshops today addresses a campaign or an area of work in which we're challenged to apply these lessons. And on September 9th, the next um, date for distributed actions around the globe and in the US, we have an opportunity to try to apply these lessons in a new way um, and want, I want you to join us in truly broadening the movement um, in a fundamental way. Our first speaker, Jackie Patterson, who agreed to come here without big fees or a fancy venue because she saw that we were trying to do something important. This was a gesture of solidarity of the kind this movement desperately needs. Jackie Patterson is the NAAC Environmental and Climate Justice Program Director. Since 2007, she has served as a coordinator and co-founder of Women of Color United. She's worked as a researcher, program manager, coordinator, advocate, and activist, working on women's rights, violence against women, HIV and AIDS, racial justice, economic justice, and environmental and climate justice. She recently participated in the National 350 live stream that was <clears throat> broadcast to counter President Trump's State of the Union message. Please welcome Jackie Patterson. Yeah, so, thank you. Thank you, thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I really, um, it's it's a joy, and it's good to see all the seats filled and with the, your enthusiasm, and great to hear about the activities you're planning in the coming days and weeks, and knowing the, the great activism that's happening here. So first, I want to thank 350 and um, Sierra Club, Port, the Puerto Rico Agenda, the Interreligious Eco Justice Network, and of course the Hartford NAACP and others. Oh hi, <laughs> and others who um, who have um, organized and sponsored this event. It's really a joy to, to be here with you all again. And so I wanted to bring my remarks, my brief remarks, through the kind of lens of stories because I always feel that the stories are illustrative of, of the realities of what's happening. A lot of times we talk in kind of concepts or ideals and so forth, but really wanted to kind of ground us and what's happening in communities as a call to action, but then also what's happening in communities as a pathway that we can follow uh, as, as the resistance is always, already rising around these um, issues in, of advancing environmental and climate justice. So first off, in, in terms of my own story, as a black woman who is a daughter of a father who immigrated from Jamaica, uh, West Indies, and um, a mom who immigrated from the, the black belt of Mississippi, I, um, I live a life of intersectionality. Um, it's in acknowledging, embracing, and addressing the climate crisis through the lens of intersectionality that I think that the solutions um, in advancing climate justice lie. In the words of Martin Luther King, none of us are free if one of us is oppressed. And as he also said, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. Therefore, I believe I exist and I believe we all exist within an inextricably linked tapestry of multiple oppressions and attributes and, um, and opportunities. And so the oppressions, the, unfortunately um, dominate certain communities and exclude many of us collectively from the rights to the commons that should be afforded to all. So in that vein, um, and who am I? I am a black male living in Baltimore, 
a city that buried 343 victims of homicide last year, a city where a body cam recently captured the latest evidence of evidence planting, the latest incident of, of evidence planting. I know that I can't walk down the street for fear of being harassed, at least, and brutalized and even murdered are, are not far from the realm of likelihood. I'm a single mother. I used to live in Seattle. I knew I was in trouble when the bike lanes and the cupcake shops came in. Then my rent doubled overnight, and now I sleep on a couch in my sister's place in Queens while my kids sleep on an inflatable mattress on the floor in, their living, in, our, in uh, my sister's living room. I'm a person who lives in any town USA in constant fear of violence simply because I don't conform to a gender binary, and I have buried too many who have suffered the fatal results of hate-filled homophobia. I am nine years old, and I'm a member of a family that is so poor that we can't pay our gas heating bill. And then my mother put a space heater in my room one night because I said that I was cold. That space heater late, later caught fire and burned down our home. I was so stricken with guilt that I tried to take my own life, and now I'm in a hospital ward where they're trying to, to, to heal me. I'm a member of a Navajo family living in New Mexico in the Four Corners region in the Southwest. My family has been polluted upon by four nearby coal-fired power plants to such an extent that everyone in the family has a respiratory illness. Meanwhile, 70% of the people in my community don't have access to the very electricity being generated by those coal plants. The electricity from those coal plants goes to power Las Vegas and Phoenix, Arizona. I am a female ancestor. I represent the fact that every day in the United States a woman is murdered by someone who once told her that he loved her. I am an Appalachian coal miner in a profession where 76,000 of my co comrades have died of black lung disease since 1968. Meanwhile, I have people in power who are playing politics with my livelihood and my life and threatening the very health care even that I need to breathe another day. I'm a Cameroonian woman who left the only home I've ever known as well as my family because our crops have dried up. In crossing the border, I was sexually assaulted and now I'm HIV positive. I'm a child named Serenity who lives in um, East Chicago, Indiana. The lead levels in my blood were 30 times the allowable limit and my family, like 1,100 families, was ordered to move from the only home I've ever known within 90 days from the notice that we received. I'm a woman who had to flee from my country to the United States, the very nation that is responsible for the conditions that caused me to flee from my homeland in the first place. Yet here I am called an alien, an illegal, or a terrorist, and my country is called a blank hole country by the president. My name is Warshan Shirway. I am a Somali-born Kenyan poet who says in a poem called Home, you have to remember that no one puts their child in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. And finally, I'm a father in Parkland, Florida, mourning my daughter who lost her life alongside 16 others, other faculty members and students while politicians use gun control as a political football. I am because you are. So these and so many um, other people and communities are consumed, that are consumed by these tra tra travesties illustrate for us all that systemic inequities demand systemic transformation. The crises and the discourse surrounding these crises has opened up a space that of dialogue that, it, that really calls for comprehensive intersectional shift in all that has to occur. And we've already seen, again, that resistance rising. There's a dawning recognition that we can't just tweak a system that's so deeply flawed that we have a nationwide pattern of poor communities and communities of color living in sacrifice zones where their very lives are literally sacrificed for the ex excesses of society. So we, as we think of the changes that are necessary, if it was just a mere tweaking of systems, then we would be able to just run clean water through the pipes in Flint or Baltimore or Jackson, Mississippi, or we would be able to, to apply um, small transition, uh, small um, changes. Um, but instead, we have to really think systematically in order to overcome uh, oppression and advance Dr. King's vision of a beloved community. We must address the underpinning dynamics that lead to these injustices. We can't just stop short and make things better for people in poverty, we must eliminate poverty. We can't just shop, stop short at addressing hate crimes that are just a symptom of a larger problem. We must eliminate racism, homophobia, Islamophobia, and institutionalized discrimination in our society. So as we move towards these transformations, we start to see that the, that the good news is that the resistance is rising. The resistance is embodied in all of you. The stories of the next system championship is downing like a phoenix from the ashes of, of, our, of the oppressions of, of of the past and the impressions of the present. 
the Dorothy Felix of Mossville and Environmental and Environmental Action Network and her community, which is called a sacrifice zone, are now fighting back against this cancer cluster that's developed in their communities. Casey Camp of the Ponca Nation in Oklahoma is now um, rising up with her community to fight back against oppression happening there. Deanna Lopez of the Southwest Workers Union in San Antonio, Texas, is working on everything from toxics to labor to immigration rights with Latino communities in San Antonio. Tao Vu of Boat People SOS Mercy Housing and the Mississippi Coalition for Vietnamese American Fisher Folks is fighting back against the challenges of the, arising from the BP oil drilling disaster in Mississippi. Babs Bagwell of the Ile de Jean Charles Band of the Biloxi Chittimaca Choctaw Tribe describes herself as a mother, grandmother, activist, and advocate for Earth. Her coastal community is located in an area that's losing a football field size area of land mass every day um, from due to the combination of sea level rise and oil drilling, and she is fighting back and fighting for a just relocation for her community. Climbing Poetry nearby in New York consists of two Sandy impacted youth at the, at the Caribbean Youth Exchange on Climate Resilience. She, born out of their experiences, they have launched a spoken word duo called Climbing Poetry. Their, their art is rooted in disaster activism. One of the lines from their spoken word performance stayed with me as they reflected on disaster capitalism. Who will be paid to rebuild and who will they build for? Dustin White of the Ohio Valley Environmental Action Coalition managed to, to win a, a victory after he and his colleagues did a sit-in and a fast for, um, for climate action. He is the son of a coal miner who died of black lung disease. Yeb Sanyo led the Philippines delegation to the United Nations Climate Talks in 2014, and he shed tears in front of the world as he pleaded with the United Nations um, for as they made co paltry compromises around climate justice. But in the end, the following year, there were some more stringent um, uh, commitments that were made. And so the stories are so many, and they just go on and on. But through the strength and leadership of these different um, leaders that we have out there, we, we, we know that this combined, and as we start to, to bring on more folks who are starting to lift up their actions and uh, increase their actions in terms of scale and strength, we know that we, we will win. We'll win like the Black Mesa Water Coalition won revenue for their, for their transition from coal, like the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization um, shut down two coal-fired power plants and now working on a just transition. We're one like the Homeboy Industries and Power 52 have created jobs for formerly incarcerated persons in the solar industry, and they've have trained them and placed um, um, uh, scores of people in jobs in the new energy economy. So just being in the space with all of you and hearing the announcements and so forth that you, of the actions that you'll be taking definitely fills me with hope. And together we know that we have to build this new economy, a different economy, one that values human rights. In the absence of the political will to do so, we must impose the people's will on our society. So again, as we, as we think about the transitions that we need to make in terms of heart, spirit, strategy, and action to advance just transitions, we know we have to think of our, our intertwined economic and political system and de-link the, 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 uh, that, that combination by getting money out of politics. We have to reclaim our democracy and seize our voting rights, getting, getting corporate politics out of our, uh, corporate money out of our, pol out of our politics as well as out of our courts. We have to obliterate this concept of corporate personhood. We have to have a universal implementation of a living wage. We have to stop the proliferation of military, militarization and state-sponsored violence across the globe and in our communities. We have to deconstruct the prison industrial complex and the food industrial complex and the energy industrial complex and stop the privatization of natural resources that provide basic needs like water. So the list again goes on and on, but that's why we're all here for this day and this teaching. And I think we'll start to get down into the specifics about how all of this happens. But as we think about how we work together, we, we ground ourselves in the principles um, of Jemez, principles of democratic organizing, being inclusive, emphasizing bottom up organizing, letting people speak for themselves, working together in solidarity and mutuality, building just relationships amongst ourselves, and committing to self transformation. So it's through replacing systems rooted in extraction, exploitation, exploitation and domination with principles and practices of regeneration, cooperation, and resilience, communities are rising up, coming together and practicing Dr. Martin Luther King's vision of revolutionary love. In the wise and powerful words of Asada Shakur, it is our duty to fight. It is our duty to win. We must love and respect one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. And as I said in the closing at the, at the national event that was referenced, 
organized by 350, it is in this uprising and it's in this principled resistance and in this practice of revolutionary love that lies our hope for a just transition. Thank you. Thank you.